Hello everybody. This is a pretty long video, so I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to go over. We're pretty much starting from scratch on how to work with materials. You're going to be building your own material first. Once you've learned the basic building blocks of materials and some of the core nodes that you would use, we're going to start looking at some of the starter content materials to really understand how those have been put together. During the trip, you're really going to understand how UVs work with assets that you import. And near the end, we'll also start looking at some of the glass properties that are getting a little more advanced. We'll take a sneak peek at the mannequin, but take a look at the table of contents if you need to jump around. But otherwise, let's get into it. So from the beginning, I'm in 5.2. I want to start with a games template just to keep things nice and light and easy. I'm going to go with the third person. We might look at the mannequin materials later. But we want to make sure we have starter content enabled here and go ahead and just give it a name and create. I highly encourage you follow along. That's the best way to learn is to learn by doing. A couple of things I like to do when I start a new project is initially I go to my editor preferences and I search for middle to fix the whole middle mouse issue. Middle mouse pan enable that and also I like to set my content browser docked in layout all right let's start at the beginning of materials what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my starter content and props and I'm gonna drag out the classic chair all right so drag that chair into your level and let's take a look at the chair as it's doing its shading and we have a static mesh chair here and if we look at the details Give a little space here. If we look at the details, we'll see this here is listing the static mesh we're using of the chair. And if you scroll down a little bit more, you'll see there is one element. We'll get back to that later. But what that really means now is there's one piece of geometry, solid. And that one piece of geometry is receiving one particular material element. Again, we'll get back to that in a little more detail later with a little more complex object. But for now, this is telling us for this element, we are using this particular material, M chair. We'll eventually kind of reverse engineer what's going on inside this material, but I really do want to start from the basics and start building our own material that we can build up to look like this particular chair. So let's do that. Let's go all the way up to the top of your content folder right click create a new folder let's call it my mats and go inside there right click and grab a fresh new material and we'll call it uh, capital M underscore kind of a common naming convention folks use for materials and we'll just say we can call it chair for now you can kind of call it whatever you want and we'll use it on the chair so we'll just call it M chair and double click to open up your brand new material. This is where it all begins. So when you double click and open, you're gonna get the material editor here. Yours by default might be a little bit smaller. I'm gonna close the stats window. I don't need that right now. And you should have this big block. Now in here you right mouse click to drag around. You can middle scroll to zoom in and out. And this represents the beginning of the material. So this contains the properties that make this look like what it looks like. Now there's a lot of rabbit trails we can get on from the beginning, but I am going to try and just keep it uh, simple and build on top of that. So we'll add complexity as we go along. We just really got to make sure you understand the basics so we have a solid foundation to build on. So let's look at some of the settings we have here. Some of them are grayed out and some of them aren't. That has to do with uh, different settings that you can have on a material. Just a sneak peek that's down here, but we'll get to that later. First, the most obvious thing you would probably consider when looking at a material is what color is it? And you'll see if I hover here, it says define the overall color of the material, blue shirt, white shirt, green shirt. And so let's deal with this first. Now over here, you'll see the sideways palette tab. And if you open that up, these are all the nodes that you can use for building up material. And there are a lot to choose from. I'm gonna go up to the search and type three, the number three. And that still kind of doesn't whittle down for us easily uh, what we want uh, because there's a lot of things that have three in it. It's a 3D package, so that makes sense. The number three would be used a lot. 
But the thing that we want to feed into our base color again to get started with is this constant three vector. So click on that and you'll see there's a little three here as well. That means it's a hotkey. We'll get to that in a little bit. So grab a constant three vector and drag it onto your little palette here. And this node represents a three part number. So it says X, Y, Z, but we're going to be using it as an RGB. Really, it's just three numbers to define our color. So you can click on this little black spot here and that'll pop open a color picker. One thing to notice when you say, let's say I want to do red, you'll click over here in red and you think you have red here, but the default over here is that its value is set to zero. So you're going to want to drag that up to the value you want. So you can use the color wheel here, but just make sure you drag that up. Otherwise you'll be like, what the heck? I put in red and it's still black. So that's because your value defaults to zero and click OK. And now this little node represents that red value. And the way that you get your final object. So this this is the visualization of currently what this node is outputting. We'll get into what I mean by currently later. You can change where your network is evaluating. But again, we'll get to that. So let's just take this output here. So when you drag from here, this represents all three values together. And I'm going to drag that into the base color. And that knows it can accept the three values as a color. And give that a second to update on your object here. And now you have a red material. And what I'm going to do, again, we're starting off really basic here. I'm going to grab the tab, drag it up next to my project tab here of third person map. I'm going to save this material. It's not very complex, but we'll add complexity soon and go back to your project. And a quick way to assign a material to an object is you just drag and drop that material onto the object. So you do that, you let the shading process for a bit. And now you see that your chair has gone from its multicolored yellow and gray to the solid red that you chose. Also notice over here the element zero slot has filled in with the name of your material, your M, M chair. All right, that's not too crazy so far, is it? Let's go back to our material. And again, let's just double click to change the color here. I'm going to show you a little sneak trick in a second. So we make it green. We say OK, and I go over to the map, and I notice my chair is still red. Now, one of the reasons is we haven't saved what we've modified here. You can see there's a little asterisk here. That means we haven't saved it, and the Save button has not been clicked. You could hit this Apply button. Notice it says Apply the changes to the original material and use it in the world. So when you click Apply, it's technically not saved. But if you go over to the map, you'll see that it updated to show you that your chair has turned green. Now, already you're probably thinking, man, I, at any time I make a change here, I got to go back over here and see uh, what the effect was. There is a cool little thing you can do in your preview window here. This previews what your material looks like. You'll see that you actually have a few different shapes that you can choose from. So I got a, a cylinder, the sphere that it came default. I've got a plane, which we'll use later, looking more at textures or I got a cube or this last button's the best. This will use the mesh that you have in your content browser for the preview. So in this case, it's a perfect time to go back to our props, select the chair as a base mesh, go back to your material and hit that last little button here. And that will preview the chair as the object that's being used just to visualize what this material looks like. So it'd be perfect for us in this case. So we don't have to keep jumping back to here, back to here. Now you won't get the same exact lighting, you know, in, in your actual project, you might have spotlights or different kind of lighting setups or things that are being reflected that would give you the true look of what this object would look like. But for preview purposes, it's really handy just to have your chair in here. So if I come in here, double click, change the color. I will see that here on this preview of the chair, even though back in my map, it hasn't been updated here because I haven't told it to. So that way you can do some experimentation without juggling windows back and forth. So quite handy. So that is your base color of your object, just using a solid single color 
to fill in the value for the color. Odds are most of the objects in your cinematics or games are not gonna just be a solid flood fill. So while this is handy, while we're talking about color, we really need to talk about textures as well. And that can get pretty deep pretty quick, so we're gonna go into it slowly. Uh, let's leave this node here. And to bring up a texture node, a node that will read in a texture, you could go hunting through the palette here to try and find the one that you think it is. But there are some really common nodes you use all the time. So T is for texture. So hold down T and click. And you get a texture sample node. So this is a texture read node. It reads in a texture and outputs whatever you want. You could output any of the individual channels, which we'll see later, or you can output the RGB or the RGBA. If you have an alpha channel, go with it. And that you would plug into your base color instead of, in this case, the solid blue color. So let's plug that in. And you're gonna get an error and it says, you are missing an input texture. So what texture do you want this node to read so that it can plug it into the base color? So in this case, for this particular node, we're gonna go here to the details. We haven't talked about this yet, but any node that you select, for example, the color, these are the details to the color. You can see the RGB listed here. For the texture sample node, when you select that, the details tab updates. These are the texture sample values. And here is the slot where you tell it what texture you wanna read. So you could click on the drop down here and you can go find an existing built-in texture and there's a lot that are in here just because it's part of the project. It definitely doesn't mean any of these are potentially useful in this exact situation. Some of them are normal maps, some of them are utility maps. So not everything here is really gonna work for you in this case. You could also bring in your own texture. But for now, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna type, because I know there's some built-in brick textures and you can see them listed there, but I'm gonna search for brick and there are some naming conventions that you'll get used to eventually, but you can see this one here, T brick hewn stone ends in a D. D here represents diffuse, which what we would think of as the color for now. So go ahead and select that. And this will update. And then we have a gray wall. And if we come in here close, you can see that now the brick is showing up on the chair. So this image here, now if you wanna see this image a little bit bigger, what you can do is come down here to the texture and double click that. That opens up another tab here. This editor is very specific to the texture itself. Now if you're used to Photoshop and you see all these different little checkerboards, you might think, wait, what isn't, doesn't that mean transparency? Uh, yes, it does. We have the alpha channel enabled up here. So if you uncheck A for alpha, then you'll see the little grout lines uh, that, that come in as well, the detail for that. But if you click A for the alpha, then that shows you where the matting is happening. Uh, we're not gonna use the alpha for now, but we'll go ahead and leave this tab open and go back to your material. The base color itself doesn't really care about alpha at this point, that's not where you deal with alpha stuff. It just needs the three number RGB value and that's why we see what we see here on the chair. So when you have a texture going into an object, we really can't go too much farther until we have a solid understanding of UVs. So you see this UV input. Now this gets a little bit more into the asset generation side and generally you wouldn't create the UVs here in Unreal. You're gonna get that from either Maya, Blender, whatever DCC you're using to create your assets. So in your modeling package, you would create the chair and you would also do your UV layout, but we can preview and see what the UV layout looks like for a particular object. So let's do that. And that'll help understand what we're gonna do next. We're gonna, we're gonna shrink the image. We're gonna make this image look smaller. We're not really changing the size of the image, but we're gonna make it look smaller so that these rocks are a little closer together on our object. But we kind of got to understand what's going on with UVs first. So let's back up and talk about modeling and UVs. So I'm gonna go back to the content browser and I'm gonna to go to my chair and I'm gonna double click to open up the chair in the static mesh editor. All right, so here's our chair and here's the properties of our chair. What we wanna talk about is how are the UVs and what are the UVs uh, for this particular item? So if you go up here to UV, 
and show UV channel zero. So this will preview for you in a little pop-up window how the UVs are laid out. So this here represents your UV map. Again, this is probably created in one of the many 3D softwares that wasn't created inside Unreal. So this is part of your import process. This here represents a UV map and it's called UV because this is the U coordinate and this is the V coordinate. It doesn't have anything to do with ultraviolet. So UV, because X, Y, and Z are already taken. You know, when you have algebra, you probably learn, you know, your X, Y coordinates when you're dealing with 2D. But in our case, in the 3D world, X, Y, and Z are already taken as values, as variables. So they kind of needed two other letters. So somebody somewhere said, let's use U and V to represent this axis and this axis. So what a UV map is, and again, this is a whole class in itself, but a brief version is, if you took a 3D object and you opened it up and laid it out flat, like uh, like if it was made out of cardboard and you sliced it open and took every piece of it and laid it out flat, this is every part of the geometry laid out flat. And what you use this for is our textures are 2D images. So if you can imagine that brick image filling this square, wherever the different parts of the geometry are, and some of them are pretty easy to visualize, like this section here represents the seat. And so whatever on the image, so think of the 2D image. Now in our case, the image is kind of consistent all the way across, but wherever this part that represents the geometry falls on the 2D image, it's gonna cut that out and apply it onto the surface. That's one way you can think of it, or think of it as a bunch of stickers. So wherever you create a sticker sheet here and you peel off this part of the sticker and put it onto the object, whatever was on that piece of paper as a sticker is gonna get applied over here. So it's, it's a way to transfer information from a 2D world. So this square representing a 2D image that you feed it, that's our texture that we fed it. Whatever you put in there, Whatever the colors are that are underneath these individual faces get applied onto the individual faces on the 3D asset. Hopefully at the moment that makes enough sense for you, you're really just transferring 2D information off of the texture onto the 3D object. And this is the key of how that image transfer happens. Wherever the different parts of the geometry are represented here on the UV map, you can think of it as taking that 2D data and transferring it over here to your object for shading. So now going back to our material, that is what's happening. This, this is our image, right? If I click over here and turn off alpha for a second, here's our giant square of an image and your textures should be square and ideally multiples of two, which you see up here, 2048 by 2048, 2K as it's commonly referred. So that part of the chair was right about here. So this data here, is getting transferred over to this part of the chair. Now I probably should have used some other kind of random image off the internet so that you could see, you know, if I had Homer Simpson's head on that part of the image, you would see Homer Simpson's head on the chair. But hopefully that's enough for you to understand the idea. Now what we wanna do is when you're reading a texture sample, it's coming in as this whole image is being applied onto your UV map, but if we think the image is too big or the representation of the image looks too big out of scale, what we can do is, so this texture sample node is very common and another very common node, which is why it has its own hotkey is hold U, the U key and click and you get a texture coordinate node. And if you look at the properties of the texture coordinate node, you'll see you have a U tiling and a V tiling. So these are really common values that you wanna change when you're trying to mess with the scale of an image that's being applied to a surface. So let's take the output from the texture coordinate node and plug it into this UV input. And you don't really see much happening. That's because the defaults of the texture coordinate node are one and one. So tiling means repeating, how many times you wanna repeat it. Think of like bathroom tiles, right? you want either a single tile or you want it to be multiplied. So if I put in two and two, what that it's effectively doing is in both directions, U and V, 
two and two means if I go back to say this value here, this is the image, the base image. But when it comes to the how that image gets applied to the UVs, what it's doing is it's making two of those images here and two of those images here. So imagine here is one of that brick image and here's another of that brick image. And because they're shrunk to half the size, what this part of the chair is pulling off is now twice as small as it was before because I'm pulling it from a source image that only represents a quarter of the UV map now for that transferring process. So let's go back again and look at a little more detail. So right now I doubled it. I made it a two by two, but now I'm going to go maybe five and five. So now what this would mean is, let me let that finish. So now you see these are getting a lot smaller. What's happening is if I go back to my look at my UV map. So this UV map is not changing. What we're changing is how this UV map reads from the image is now there are five of those textures in each direction. So there's five little squares this way and five little squares this way, which means all of those little bricks are getting smaller and smaller. It's not any different than if I had taken the original image. Let's say I took this into Photoshop and I scaled it down to one fifth of the size and then tiled five this way and five this way and then saved that and then assigned that new image as my texture for my chair. You know, I would have had to swap out this for the five by five towel, but that's quite a bit more of a process than just doing this little UV node input here so that it tiles itself. One of the important things about this is for this to work, you really need this source image to be tileable, meaning you don't see any seams here. You don't see where did one of those five start and stop. So that's one of the things you got to make sure when you're using a texture that if you're going to do some of this, you need it to be tileable or seamless. Those are common words you would look for on say textures.com or any other website or source that you're using. So we've spent a little bit of time going into the base color, but really color is the most important thing you first think of when you're talking about an object. What is its color? So we've looked at, I'm just dragging and dropping. We've looked at constant colors as a constant input for part of the material. So there's our blue, or you can use a texture and modify the texture coordinate to change its size, plugging that in to the base color. If I wanted to disconnect any of these lines without plugging something else in, you can just hold Alt and click, and that disconnects. But now I have no color, so I'm gonna plug that back in. All right, let's just go back to a constant color while we talk about some of these other common inputs that we have into a basic material. In this case, you'll see the definition of this here. We call this a surface material. Okay, so let's next look at the parameter of roughness. This is kind of the next input that's useful to understand. And for that, I'm gonna switch over to the sphere just because that will kind of represent itself a little bit better with what's going on. So roughness of a surface. So look around you in your room. You probably have some things that are shiny and some things that are not. Maybe you have a mouse pad. That's not very shiny. It's very rough. So the roughness of an object will define how reflective it is, which makes it seem more or less shiny. So if I hover over here, it says, how rough is the material? So zero would mean super smooth, and therefore it would be super shiny slash reflective. And rough would mean, like a mouse pad, you don't see any light reflecting off it, and it's not very reflective. So let's look at that. Now here, this input was a three vector. Roughness is just a single value between zero and one. So hold down the one key and click. And that's a single value vector input. And go ahead and connect that to your roughness input. Now the default value is zero, which is why as soon as that updates, you can see the reflection of the image around here in the surface because now what we're telling the material is it is perfectly smooth. Its roughness is zero. It has no roughness, so it's super smooth. Let's go ahead and change that value to one to see the opposite. And now it's perfectly matte. There is no reflection at all. If you look around, you don't see the building reflected anywhere. So it's sucking up and redirecting all the light on the surface. You're not getting any highlights because 
the surface is rough, so there's getting a little too deep, but all the light rays are being bounced in all different directions, so you don't see any particular focus on one part of the scene around it. So that's a fully rough surface, and then you have values in between, 0 and 1. You can also change it down here, so say 0.1. It's going to be a little shiny, but not as shiny as it was when we had it at 0. So let's put a 0.5 right in the middle, and you, get, you can see a little light highlight. And you can't really see the building reflected, but there is a little bit of a highlight from a light. So again, look around your exact room and look for things that have these different properties. For example, if you look at your mouse, possibly your mouse is somewhere in the middle here. You might see a reflection of a light in your mouse, but it's not that focused. If you look at your phone, take, you know, take a look at your phone and look, and you can probably see a really good reflection of a light behind you or something. And that, that would represent you know, on the glass surface, you know, that's that's getting close to zero. Zero is perfectly reflective, which is what your phone is. But if you look at your back of your phone, depending on what you have in your phone case, again, you're getting back into more of a, a matte material. Might look something more like 0.5 or depending what you have, 0.8. Really, really rough on my little OtterBox case. And so when you think about what value you want for your roughness, it's really going to depend on what is the surface, is it something that's supposed to be smooth and shiny or is it supposed to be something that's really rough? So I'll go ahead and set this to 0.1 just because I like shiny and we'll leave it there for now. Now related to this in terms of shine and such, related but not the same, you'll see there's an input here for metallic. So it says control how metal-like your surface is. Common convention for this is that it's a little more of a binary option. It's either zero or one. Your surface is either made of metal or it is not. So I'm gonna hold down the one key to get another one of these single value inputs and I'm gonna plug that in. So say this sphere is plastic, then you would put in a value of zero because it's not metallic. And this would be the result of what a plastic, super shiny, you know, because the roughness is set really low. So it's still a shiny plastic. I'm going to set the value to zero just to really emphasize the difference here, the roughness value. So now I have a super smooth surface, and this is a plastic super smooth surface. You know what I'm going to do also is I'm going to switch back to the chair. Uh, do I have it selected here? Yeah, so to do this, whatever you have selected here is what will be used when you hit this button. So you got to make sure you have it selected. All right, so I'm going to go back to the chair so we can see the effect. So this would be a super smooth plastic non-metallic chair. So let's turn it into metal by going to this value here for metallic and setting that to one. And then you get the result of a blue metallic chair. So now that you see the difference, you're like, ooh, yes, I can see that's like a blue chrome type chair. So it's a little funky looking. But that is fully metallic, fully reflective, and meaning super smooth, value of zero, with a base color of blue. Let's come back and revisit this idea of textures and the importance of understanding how UVs work because it's not just color that's affected by textures and also by the UVs for a particular object. Let's see what happens when we take our texture sample and plug it into the roughness instead of a constant value here. So right now when you use zero, every part of the object is zero. It's as if you went to this image and made everything black. So your entire object is getting a value of zero. But your UVs are active for things beyond just the base color. So let's take this texture sample and we can grab the RGB. It's going to use just the grayscale value of the RGB or if I wanted I could pick just the R. Let's see what the R looks like. If I go to our texture and I turn off the green and the blue I get this, which looks a lot like if I add the green and the blue, right? Because it's this is just a, a grayscale image already, and it looks like each channel has the same amount of gray in them. So I could either use the red, or if I grab the RGB, it's it's gonna look the same because it has they all have the same value for this particular image. And so going back to the material here, let's take the red and plug that in for our roughness, and let's see what's gonna happen. So a couple things to note. It's a little tough to see the difference here. Let's also turn off the uh, metallic. I'm going to go ahead and set this to zero so it's a little less. 
prominent. And you can kind of see, I'll find a better example in a minute, but notice where the light is reflecting. So let's get in here really close. Notice is I'm, I'm looking down here where the light highlight is. As I come across here, you see the light reacting differently and you can kind of start seeing the image of the bricks showing up here. Now, the color, just to clarify, the color is constant. The blue that you see is constant across the whole surface. So what's going on? Why do I see some variation going on here? The same UVs that are being used when we were looking at color before are being used now to vary the amount of roughness across the model based on where the UVs are picking up the image data. So what's happening is wherever the brick color here, now this uh, again is probably not the best example because these are pretty close gray colors. It's a, it's a pretty neutral image. Uh, I'll grab a checkerboard in a minute and we'll see a really extreme difference. But what's happening is the closer you get to white in this image, the less reflection you're going to see because that is the same as remember if I plug this back in really quick and I put in a value of one then we get a super matte image so the parts of this image that are closer to one the surface is going to look more like this and the opposite is true if I put it to zero parts of this image that are closer to black are going to be closer to zero, which means your roughness is going to be zero, which means it's going to be smooth. Let's actually go ahead and make that swap now. Um, I'm going to move this over here. I'm going to hold T and let's go get a, I know there's a checkerboard in the starter content. So let's, this is a new texture sample node to read a new texture. So I'm going to click on the search here and the name of the checkerboard texture is actually grid. So go ahead and search for grid and grab that texture. And this is a very big grid, right? So you have just a two by two. If I double click and open it, uh, you know, this is a pretty big, pretty big grid here. I turned off the alpha just so it doesn't show me the transparency there. So this is a pretty large grid. And again, imagine your texture lining up here with the UVs. I have a giant black square in this region and a giant black square here. So the seat, if we were looking at color, the seat would just be solid black. And my roughness, if I plugged it in like this, would also be solid black. So I'm not really gonna see uh, the variation that I'm looking for. So what I can do is, going back to my material, I'm gonna use that same node to adjust the tiling. So I'm gonna hold down U and click to get a texture coordinate node, run that into your UV input so I can do some tiling. I'm gonna make it a 10 by 10 grid I'm going to take that and bump that up 10 by 10. So now this is tiling 10 times in each direction. So the size of these squares relative to my uh, UV map. So instead of a black and a white here and here, I'm going to have black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, 10 times this way and 10 times that way. So back to the material. Let's plug this in. So now I have very extreme values of black or white, which means I'm going to go from a roughness of zero or a roughness of white. So let's, uh, let's just use the red value. Again, it shouldn't differ between red or RGB. You get the same result and plug that into roughness. Now we're really going to see the extreme difference here. So let's make sure we understand what's going on now. Let's look at the back of the chair. The UVs for the chair are reading off of the image. Certain areas are fully black, which would be regions here that are super shiny. Remember, black is zero, and zero means shiny because roughness is zero. And other areas are all white for the roughness input. This isn't affecting color. Color is constant the whole time. We're just, this grid pattern you see is from the roughness being changed based on the UVs for the chair. So again, the UVs are defining. I'll probably just over repeat this so it's super, super clear. I know it's kind of tough for people if this is your first time really trying to understand this, but once you understand it, it makes things so much easier and makes so much more sense. So the idea is we have this grid image and this grid image is getting used in the UV read here. So these pieces here are reading off of that checkerboard 
and applying the different parts of the image onto the geometry based on how the modeler laid out their UVs. So back here, now let's, if, if you're still a little, mm, what exactly is the difference here? Let's show how the UVs affect both base color and roughness the same. Let's take the RGB and plug that in for the base color. Let's disconnect the checkerboard from roughness for a minute. So I'm going to alt click that. So now we're back to the idea of this is your color, right? The checkerboard is now driving the color. You have white and you have black because this image is being read by the UVs but applying to the color. So you can see it matches up the same. If I put this back here and I can use this as well. Either one comes back here. The alignment of the checkerboard is the same because in both cases, for any case, actually, for any case of the material, when you're applying textures, 2D textures using texture mapping, it's based on your UV layout. That's why it's so important to understand uh, how the UV layout works and how it reads textures and applies it onto your model. Back to the material. So with a base understanding now of how UVs and textures work in the different inputs that you have for a material, let's go back to our base scene here. So we have this chair that we applied our material to and we haven't saved our material. So let's jump over here, hit save, come back over to the map and you'll see the updated material applied, which right now is just blue and shiny. The material we applied is to an instance of our chair that's in the library. So let's bring in another chair, the original base chair. So if you look at this chair that comes in the starter content, you see there's actually two colors involved. You have the orange and you have the gray. So you might assume that there is a color texture out there that is part gray and part orange that would line up and match with the different parts of the chair, right? So that there'd be orange underneath the pad and there'd be gray underneath the rail, but it gets a little more tricky actually in the real material. Again, we're not gonna look at it yet. It is there, we can go look at it eventually, but uh, you can see here, M, M chair is the material, but let's not look at it yet. Let's, let's, just, let's keep building on the base of what we know. So we have some orange and we have some gray. How did this get achieved if there isn't a specific texture that is this color input? So let's go to our material and let's go over a new node that's really useful and it's called a lerp. So a lerp node, let's move these out of the way. I'm gonna just ditch these for the minute just for clarity. We're just gonna focus on messing with color for the moment just to understand the lerp. So lerp stands for linear interpolation. So interpolation, you've probably used the word more in an animation sense, like you uh, interpolate between keyframes. So you fill in values in between. So it's kind of a similar idea, but if you hold down L, and click, you get a lerp node. And what a lerp node does, it takes two inputs, A and B, and it mixes those based on this input you hear called alpha. It doesn't need to be an alpha channel per se in the way you might think of it as a mask, but it's basically an image between black and white, zero and one, that will control how much of A and how much of B gets output. So let's let's do an example here. I'm gonna control D to make a duplicate of my color node and let's give it a different color. So let's give it a red. So I have a color input of blue going into A and I have color of red going into B. And I'm gonna plug the result of that into base color. So what we get at the moment because we haven't given it any specific value, you can hand set this value. So notice if I set this to zero, it's gonna get all of the input from A, which is blue, and feed that out here. If I set this to one, it's gonna get all of the B and send that out to the base color. So the extremes are easy to understand. And then what happens with partial values, it's just blending or mixing or interpolating between these two values, whatever they are. They don't have to be solids, but it's easier to understand what this is doing with solids, right? So your alpha, your value here, is determining what comes out here between A and B. But more commonly, you would use this alpha input as an image. So let's take our checkerboard that we have. Again, if I just grab the red, it's a value between white and black. 
and I plug that into the alpha input so that again, based on the UVs of the model, it's gonna apply that black and white image to the geometry. And in this case, where those values are is used to vary the alpha input. So let's connect that. And what you'll see is checkerboards of blue and red. These two are being varied across the surface based on how this black and white image is being used across the UV map and getting transferred onto the geometry. So the parts of the geometry where this alpha value is zero is getting all of A, where it's one is getting all of B, and that's getting fed into the base color. So how does this relate to the idea of our chair having some gray and some orange? Well, let's go over that. So instead of using the checkerboard, let's go ahead and uh, just disconnect that for now. Alt click. I'll leave it here in case I need a checkerboard later. I'm gonna hit T and make another texture node. And I'm gonna go over here to the details and I'm gonna do a search and I'm gonna search for chair. And there is a chair texture here, T for texture that I'm gonna choose. And let's double click to see what it looks like in the texture editor. So a unique image for sure. Let's turn off the alpha for a second. So this particular image on its own doesn't really seem to make any sense, right? Because we know we don't have a purple seat and we don't have yellow framework. So what, what in the heck is going on on this image? This is a really useful texture to us, but we have to understand how it's used. Let's first look at each channel at a time. So we have this R channel and the R channel if you look, this is kind of darkening areas of the image that line up with the UVs where you might get some ambient occlusion or areas where light might not get in as much. And this this will come in useful eventually, but for what we're dealing with now, just the base color of our object, let's see what's in the green channel. So if we go to the green channel, we see a map here that defines, these are the rails. Let's also take a look at the B. The B channel, is the seat and the back pad of the chair. Now, if you weren't the one that modeled this chair, it might be a little unsure of exactly what it is. Because again, if we go back and look at the UVs, these came imported and you know you can kind of imply that just by looking at it, these shapes here are probably this part of the, the chair. And, and notice where the these parts are white. That's the blue channel. Let's go back to our material, take the blue channel and plug that in as an input for the alpha of the lerp node. And let's pull back a little bit, see what our chair looks like. So what this is telling us is where that image, where this image is white and where the image is black is determining which color blue or red is getting passed through into the base color. So this is implying that, that, and that. These pieces here, these three parts of the padded part of the chair, those are represented on the UV map here, here, and here. And that lines up with the UVs here. So this image, that texture was made based on knowing where these different parts of the, the model were flattened out on the UV map. Now, knowing what we know about UVs now, we can also use that same output to control the roughness of the chair. That's gonna get a little bit trickier, but again, it's these are all building blocks, and once you see them used in little cases at a time, it actually starts to make sense. It's not that crazy. So this part here is dealing with the color. Now, we know how roughness works now. What we wanna do is use alert node again Using this same input, we can control the reflection of the different parts of the chair through the roughness. So let's hold L and put down a lerp node. Now in this case, we're going to not give an, a particular input. We could, uh, but you can see the defaults are zero and one. Remember zero would mean shiny, one would mean rough. So let's look again at our chair sample and one, this would be rough, 
black would be a roughness of zero. So we can use the same map to control which part of the lerp gets passed to the material, back to the material. So let's take the same output here and put it into the alpha, which will control which of is zero and which is one. So because, again, let's just double check our logic here. The input here, alpha, when it is one, that grabs from B, which actually, ironically, is one. When it's black, it grabs from A. And any value in between would blend the two, as we saw with the color blending. But our map here is pretty solid, either white or black. So we have a pretty uh, easy definition between the two. And let's plug the output of this into our roughness. And what we would expect to see, before I do it, is the red of the cushion should be very matte and not shiny. But the handles and the frame of the chair, which is going to match up with a value of zero, is going to be very reflective and shiny. So let's apply that and wait a second for it to resolve. And that's what we see. We see the handle and the frame is shiny which represents a roughness closer to zero. And the, the chair here, the padded part of the chair, is pulling from B, feeding into here, which is closer to one, which a roughness of one means it's not very shiny at all. So next, we're gonna talk about another node that is just as common as these. So let's move these out of the way for a minute. And let's look down here at this input emissive color. So emissive color, as it says there, controls what parts of your material will appear to glow. So let's start with just a, uh, you know, hold down one and click. And let's plug in this as an input. So emissive color, uh, we're just going with a solid here. So using a single input value is similar to a three input value, but staying within the white and grays because you don't have a mix of red, green, and blue. You're kind of averaging them out as a single value here. So that's just why I'm using a single input at the moment. So let's set this value to one. Zero means it's not gonna glow at all. I'm gonna set it to one, which would be a white color uh, with a value of one. And let's see what we get. We definitely get some glow, right? So you get a lot of emission of light here. Let's go uh, save this and jump over and see how it looks in the scene because we should see some light emitting from the chair, right? So look underneath the chair, you can see some, a little bit of light boosted in there, right? So let's go back to uh, the chair. And this value of one might be a little high, right? Maybe you want just a, a little bit of glow. So I'm gonna put in uh, like 0.1 and you should, you know, you get a little frostiness, but let's say I want the glow only to come from where the seats are. So now we're going back to the same idea of using the seat image, but we're probably gonna have to modify it a little bit, right? Because the seat image, this was a value of one. Remember if I go to, where's that value here? This is a solid value of one, which is basically a turbo glow. So right, so B, the B channel has our seating as a value of one. So let's go back to the material and let's grab that blue value here, right? So here's our blue. And if we plug that into emissive color, what that means is where the seat pads are, it's gonna be glowing white, but not the rest of the chair. So let's connect that and we're gonna get like a bright glow there. But here's where we're gonna use our new node and that is a multiply node. So what multiply does is as it implies, you multiply. Because right now we only have a value of a solid one going in here. And we want to be able to dial that back a little bit. But how do we do that? So hold down M for multiply and click. And you get this multiply node. So let's plug in to A. And what the multiply does is basically A times B. So I'm going to plug that into here. Now, right now, our B value is a default value of one. So it's not going to look any different it's still gonna be the same value because you're taking your blue input, the entire image, so this entire image is being multiplied by a value of one, one times anything is one, I know, tough math here. 
and that's your set value here. And then that's being run into your uh, emissive color. So no change, but now we have the ability to change this value. So let's set it to 0.5 and it's only gonna affect the padded region because the rest of the image is black. So zero times anything is zero. So that won't be affected. The arms and the frame aren't gonna be affected at all. So let's go to 0.1. So as we dim some of those down, we'll get a slightly different color there. We could alternatively um, make this a parameter. So a parameter means you have access to control this as an input. So let's, uh, we'll go the long way. So hold down one and click and plug that into here. And we're back to uh, no emission because the value is zero into B, zero times whatever's coming in is knocking it all down completely to zero. So our emissive color as a total being multiplied by zero here is zero. Let's set it back to one again. Now there are times where uh, you don't want to have to come into your material every time you want to change this. So let's pause for a moment and understand the concept of this multiply node. It's very commonly used to just, you know, give you the ability to adjust these values that you're multiplying something by um, here, or this is where we're going to kind of shift gears for a moment while we've covered a lot of the common nodes of multiply, lerp, texture, and the uh, texture coordinate node. So let's talk about the idea of a material instance. I'm going to create what's called a parameter for this node. I'm going to right click on it and choose convert to parameter. And that just allows you to give it a name and make it available externally so that you can modify it without having to come inside the material here. So let's give it a name. Let's call it the uh, seat emission molt, something like that. All right. And the seat emission molt parameter here is defaulting to one. So we'll leave that at one and let's save this. Now a pretty common, um, uh, stepping higher than the example of just what we're doing here, a pretty common workflow is when you make a material, so where did I make my material? Here in the uh, My Mats folder. When you make a material, this would be considered a master material. It is the master pattern, right? So it's the baseline material you may want to use this material on multiple instances of the chair, but still have the ability to make changes individually on those instances. So what you would do is this is your master material, which you may not use directly on your items. So right click on it and choose create a material instance. So a material instance is kind of like a copy or kind of like a child of the parent material here. So it's, uh, you know, M chair inst, so it renamed it for you. A common naming convention is to, you could you could leave it called that, but you'll also see people put MI for material instance. So you can see it in the name there. So I have a material instance and I'm gonna assign that instead to our chair here. So you won't really see anything change because right now the child is the same as the, the parent chair. So if I select the chair, you'll see it's now using MI chair versus M chair and this is a material instance. So when you want to modify your material instance, if you double click it, you're going to say, wow, that looks totally different. So double click and you don't see what we saw before. You'll see the parent is listed. So here's M chair. That's the parent that we've been working with the whole time. So this is the parent material or the master material. If you look at the instance, this is what you get and you kind of can't change anything here by default. Now, because we added that item called the parameter in our master material here, we added this here, we converted that into a parameter. When you convert something into parameter, that makes it available for editing in your instance. So you can see here that this checkbox, if I enable seat emissive multiply, I can now modify that value. Now this instance of MI chair is gonna update. When I go back to my scene, I don't need to necessarily save it because it's just reading that value directly into my element and updating here on the surface. Odds are you'd be using two screens so that you can have this, you know, pulled away separately and then you can make changes and see it on your other screen here. Um, but you also see it here in the editor. I'm gonna put it back here. So anything that you wanna have access to 
at an instance level, you would need to convert into a parameter. For example, let's go back to our chair here. Uh, what else do we have here that we might want to change? Um, we had the lerp controlling the roughness. So, okay, that's a good example. Let's say, let's say this roughness right now, it's a pretty extreme range between zero and one. And we have the alpha that's black and white kind of switching between these, but let's say we don't want perfectly it's going in the roughness we don't want perfectly smooth and perfectly matte maybe we want to have uh, the ability to control that in the material instance so what I can do is hold one and click and either do that again or hit control D to have two different inputs here and I'm going to connect those into my a and B input and I'm going to give them their own default value zero and one so so far I haven't changed anything but I'm going to convert them into parameters and I'm going to call the first one here I'll call it my rough min and the other one here I'll call my rough max and because I've converted them into parameters they have a default value so you see it has a default if you want you can select a set a min and max but now when I save this is my master material again when I save the master and look at the uh, material instance, which is right here, you'll see that I now have access to change those values as well. So right now, if I look at the chair, that's a good place to see. Uh, look at the reflection here in the chair. That's being driven by this rough min of a value of zero. Remember, zero roughness is fully shiny. But let's say I want to make a change to that for the instance of this material on the chair. I can click that box and then maybe I can uh, you know set it to point 0.2 so it's not going to be quite as reflective and then you see that update here and if you go back into your map you'll see it updated there see how it's getting a little a little more matte there you know it's still reflective you can still see the highlights from the light it's not as dull as this here but it is not as reflective as it was a minute ago now the benefit of this is maybe you want to have um, you know, this would be one instance of, say, less shiny chairs. But if you make another instance of your material, so am I chair shiny? And let's assign that to this other chair. All right, so here, look at the difference in the, uh, the arms. So in this arm of the chair, I've really hot highlight there so that's getting the value of zero if I double click to open the shiny material instance I haven't modified the values here over the master so it's just using what the master has so coming back here that's how you can use one master material and set up instances to make slight changes but that way you still have control at a high level for your master here and the other thing that lets you do is if you want to make a global change, you can go into your master material and let's see what's something else we can change here. Um, well, let's just change the color. Say all the chairs, you need to make a slight color because this is a master material and we haven't made any different parameters for that. I can come in here and change the frame to be yellow and saving the master material. If I come back into my map, the instances are also updated because I don't have anything in my instances that are modifying that particular value. If you do have something that you've set, the, these thumbnails, oh, there, I touched them and they updated. I was gonna say they haven't updated yet, but now they have. If you do set something on an instance, for example, if I go to that uh, value here, so here I've modified the rough min and the multiplier here. If you make a change to an instance, and then you change that parameter in the master as well, this is still gonna win. What you set on an instance, if you've enabled it and set it, that value overrides whatever might be coming from the master, even though you change the master and make a save, because that's what this purpose is. This is what you're saying when you check this box is, I wanna set this value explicitly on this particular use of the material instance. All right, so let's go back to M chair. So we've kinda, we made a little bit of a mess here. What I want to do now is now that we understand some of the basics such as setting a parameter or 
you know, the LERP and the multiply and the texture sample and the texture coordinate. I'd say those are like the big five and how to use a three vector and a single vector input. Let's take a look at, at the actual material used in the sample content. And let's see if we can figure out now how they did their chair. So let's go to the third person here, go into the starter content, go to props, go to the chair itself. I'm gonna double click and open the original chair in the editor. And I'm gonna turn off the UVs here, set it to none. And let's take a look and understand where this material gets all of its settings. And you'll see there is a master material here called M chair. That's their M chair, not our M chair. Notice the path goes into the starter content, props, materials, M chair, right? So you go to materials, somewhere in here is M chair. Where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? M, 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 M. Oh, it's in here somewhere. Oh, sorry, actually it's under props, materials. So here's M chair right here. So I'm gonna double click and open the material that is used on the default starter content for the chair. So opening this up, you might say, wow, what, what have they done in here different than us? Not, not that much actually. So this shouldn't be that hard to understand now that we've gone through and built our own version of it. So let's take it apart piece by piece. So up here, starting at the top, we have a color. We have two colors. We have a gray and we have an orange and that's going into a lerp node. Now remember the LERP is to output between this and this based on the zero to one value coming into the alpha, which is also getting its information from the UV map. So let's see what they're feeding into the alpha input. So you come down here and that is that same texture we've seen already and that is the blue output and that is what we've built. If we go to our texture for the chair and the blue, this is the seat pad all by itself highlighted and everything else dark. There's a little hint of things here, but for all effective purpose, we'll just say it's it's dark. And let's go, uh, that's our M chair. We're gonna go to their M chair. And so that output of the seats being white is being fed into the LERP. So that's kind of what we've done already. Then what's happening is, you know, eventually we know this is going to the color input way down here, but they're doing a few more things on theirs. So this is coming out here feeding into this LERP as the A input. And then you have a, a, a pretty bright white here as another input. So what, what's being used for the white? So remember where the alpha is zero, you're gonna get all A going through and where it's one, you're gonna get all B going through and anything in the middle is gonna blend between those. So let's take a look at this alpha input, we feed this over here and that goes to the green channel of that image. So let's see what the green channel looks like of T chair M. The green channel is highlighting these parts of the chair. And so wherever this is white, you're gonna get the B output, which is just another color going into B. So now what this will allow us to do is to really see on the chair what, what those yellow lines here, they're not yellow, they're white when we look at the actual texture. But when you have R and G and B together, the math of those together looks yellow, but we're really just grabbing the G channel, so that is effectively white that we're using. So now, whatever turns white on the chair, we know that's what this represents. So let's go back to looking at the material, and let's switch our preview here over to the chair. So I'm gonna go grab my prop chair, Go into the material and hit that button again. All right, so what is white? Now it's kind of hard to tell. What is white versus what is this this gray color? So where what's being defined is the difference. So it's looking like the gray is this part of the chair and the white is now being defined as this part of the chair. And if we really wanna double check and see what that is, all we need to do is just change these colors real quick. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna say, you know what, let's make this green. Then I can really tell what that part of the UV is defining. So that's, yes, that is that part. And if I come up here and change this to a totally different color, then I can see that's 
the blue aspect there. So these rails here are defined as everything that's white here. It's kind of a subtle difference when you look at the original uh, material here. Let's, let's undo that so we get back to what we had before. So it's, you know, when you're not looking that closely, you just kind of see silver and you just think that's a dark silver in there, but that's actually, they're setting it up as a different color. So you see this is a slightly darker gray and this is a little bit more white. And because it is gonna be a lower roughness value, you get a little bit of a, like aluminum because of the reflections that you see. So let's continue going down here, see what else we got. The output of that for the color, we're still dealing, we're still making our way into base color. But you see the output of this is now going into a multiply. And we know what a multiply does, it multiplies. So that color coming out here is being multiplied by what's coming into B. So let's see what is coming into B. If we go back to that same image, this is now the red channel of that image. So let's go look at the image, switch to the red channel. And this is what's in the red channel. And where you're seeing, again, this is kind of looking like the ambient occlusion idea of, you know, when, when something, like if you look around somewhere around in your room, like say under a speaker or under the monitor, it's kind of like in the cracks. There's not as much light getting in there and that's kind of referred to as the ambient occlusion. What's being occluded from ambient light. And so we're kind of cheating this. We don't have to do this in lighting. We're actually cheating it by putting it into the material. So this around here by the base of the seat, and around here, this is gonna start getting a lot darker because remember it's a multiply. White isn't gonna do anything, but when it starts getting darker, that means your actual color is gonna get baked in a darker color. So let's see that how that's being used. Let's go back to our, uh, whoops, our material over here. So it's, you know, it's kind of a subtle effect. You wouldn't notice the difference necessarily. Let's look, um, let's look at one of the places where I had it. Now it's kind of hard because you also have the reflection of light going on. So this area here, and because of the way the light is kind of self-correcting, it's kind of hard for us to see it as well. But anyway, um, this in here should be a little bit darker if we disconnect the multiply that's going on and connect in directly. So we're ignoring that darkening effect. Right now, if we take from this output and go into the base color to see what the difference is. So let's let that re-cook and it's pretty subtle. It's really a hard difference to tell. Let's see if I can find somewhere a little more. Let's go back and look at the map. Where's a place that really is painted to be a lot darker? Um, kind of around the base of the seat, possibly. I, I want to see the effect of turning on and off this multiply image. So maybe around that little top part of the, the headrest. Let's see if we can catch that in there. Um, so what they're doing is they're darkening the headrest as it tucks under, maybe so you don't get any bright spots under there where you wouldn't expect a bright spot. So let's take a look at that. Let's get where we can see. So notice back here, it is what it looks like. Now, actual light is also not getting back in there. So it's we're kind of faking an effect, but we're also dealing with the real lighting ambient occlusion as well. But let's, let's go ahead and plug the multiply effect back in and see if we can see it here. So plug that in. Oh yeah, we can totally see it now. See how much darker this got? That's because the multiply is actually affecting the color of the texture and it's adding the shadowing through the texture and through the material, not through the actual lighting of the scene. The actual lighting of the scene, the shading of that comes through. If we bypass this again, we're just going to ignore the multiply that's going on and go into the base color. That's the darkening you see in here is from light just not getting in there. But we're faking light not getting in there by doing this additional multiply. I say we, but I mean they, whoever put this chair together. All right, but at least now we understand what's going into the color input. Now let's take a look at the uh, metallic. So what's going on in the metallic input? So they have a LERP node and there's no inputs, but the default is zero and one, and you have an alpha input setting that, and that's going into the G. So let's go to the chair, look at the G input. Again, that's the, the rails or the, the, arm, the arm and feet of the chair is being highlighted here. And so what that means is where it's one, you're gonna get fully metallic. Where it's zero, it's gonna be not metallic. And that's what we see um, going on here in the chair. So we get the effect of metal. So it's reading as a metal 
on the surface here. Now you might think, well, wasn't it shinier when we did the metal before? Um, yes, in the example we did of the blue chair, it was super shiny, but that that the metallic input again is just zero or one. So what we're telling the arms in this exactly is these are metal, this is not, nor is this little piece back here. So the arms and legs are metal, the rest is not. Now, how smooth is it? That's defined by roughness. So now let's investigate what's going on with their default material for roughness. We look at the lerp node. And well, let's, let's go even back a little bit farther here. And they've actually named their parameters nicely. So they've got a roughness base, roughness seats, and roughness metal. So this first lerp node, and, and all these are being combined together to give you a single input into the roughness. But by using the multiple lerps and the use of the, the different parts of the texture, you can really define what parts do what. So this first lerp is using the B input. Now remember the B input was the pads, pads of the chair. Where's our texture? Right, so we're using this information to define that first lerp node. So the difference, what's being output based on whether the, the pad is on or not. So alpha is where the pads are, which means the B input is the pads, and that's getting a default value. As it says, roughness for the seats is default 0.2. And otherwise, so the rest of the chair is being set to a value of 0.5 in this base value. So all this lerp node is doing in a way is setting the what we need it for is it's setting the roughness of the seats and it's just kind of a default value of 0.5 that's going through like it says roughness base you could call it roughness default it's just passing through here but then we hit this lerp node which again takes that information and interpolates again between a or b input value of 0.4 roughness of the metal so the roughness of the metal default is 0.4. So what's actually going on is are the seats are going to be more reflective at a value of 0.2 than the metal of 0.4. But because these are parameters, we'll see how we can change that in an instance. But just keep going with me here. And that is going into here. So the input for the alpha is our G of the texture. So go to the G. Again, the part that's highlighting the arms and legs here and here is what's going to be pushing out that B value. So the B value being the B value being our value of 0.4. So the seats are going to be at 0.2. The arms and legs are going to be at 0.4. Everything else, which is going to be that gray stuff here, is this 0.5. And that's going into the roughness. And what we could do, well, just really quick while we're here, just so you could see the difference. So roughness metal, if I go in here and set this to zero, you're gonna see it gets super shiny really quick. Set it back to 0.4. Uh, the seats, they don't, I mean, to me, they don't look that horribly reflective, which is fine. Maybe the bottom does a little bit more. So it's gonna kind of be based on how clean and nice you want your seats to be. If I was to set this value to zero, now they're super shiny. I'll put it back to 0.2. If I don't want any reflection, like they're grungy and super grimy and dirty, um, I could put in like a 0.5 even, and that kills all the reflection on it. One would be the extreme of that. Uh, what was that, 0.2? Yeah, so set that back to 0.2. And so far, we're still kind of in territory we're familiar. Now, a new topic we haven't talked about yet, but this is a pretty common feature you want to be aware of, is normal. Um, the normal input. Now, normal doesn't mean not weird. Uh, normal is, you might want to look this up on a web page or something, but the normal of a surface is the way it's facing. So if you think of a line coming out of a surface, the perpendicular line coming out of the surface, that would be called the normal. And there's some shading tricks where you use this thing called a normal map. So this thing here, I'm going to double click and open it. So this image here, has information in it by these slightly different colors that changes the way the math works on the surface for calculating the way the surface works with light. Yeah, I might have to do a video on that topic on its own, but uh, effectively what it means is if this was all a solid blue, you wouldn't notice any difference at all. But because these lines have highlights and, and there's other aspects, maybe I'll do a little more intermediate one talking about different normal maps you can use for uh, 
fake displacing surfaces. Um, this will give you a slight appearance of the surface having more detail than it really does. So this 2D image is faking out the shading so it looks like there's maybe grooves or bumps that aren't really there, uh, but because of the way the lighting hits it, it makes it look like it's there. So you're really just faking out the surface direction by using a normal map. So let's go to the material and we see the normal map, just that whole RGB, so that that color information is important and that goes as a whole into the normal. You wouldn't pull out one version or the other. So this, I know it's a weird looking image, but that is a normal map. You can Google normal map and you'll see they all kind of have these blue, red, purple kind of variations. And let's see if we can find anywhere where you can really tell the difference on this. It's fairly subtle. Um, oh, maybe the screw back here is driven by normal Mac. Oh, there's a good idea, right? So this is a great example of where texturing saves you from having to model. So looking at the back of this, you know, looking at the back of this piece here, it definitely looks like it's been modeled to have a groove in there. But let's go to the chair itself, the static mesh of the chair, and let's flip over to the wireframe and you'll look at the wireframe and you'll see that's actually a perfectly smooth back of a chair. That detail is not there. Again, let's go back to lit. And to kind of take away this, this effect, if we go into our material, so let's go down to a very stripped version of this chair material. So I'm just gonna add a three node and I'm gonna make it, uh, what's a color we haven't been using much, pink. So I'm just gonna make a solid pink and I'm gonna quickly throw that in as the base color. So the whole thing's gonna be pink and it still looks like there's a groove here, but I'm gonna disconnect all of my other texture inputs and the groove goes away. So what that means is that groove was not there, the, the depth of that groove. You can see like a slight puckering of the geometry there. So the, the geometry's not perfectly flat, but there's definitely that detail of a groove is not in the base geometry because I have, this is the geometry. I have a single color on the entire chair and you'll see that, you know, there's, that is the chair, that is the geometry and, you know, there's a slight warp in the back of the chair, but that, that, the definition of that groove is not there. So uh, let's see if we plug the metallic back in. That doesn't really have any of the information about the groove. Let's plug the roughness back in. That doesn't make a difference. So that groove is solely coming through the input of the normal. And that's why a normal map is really important to add that kind of detail so you don't have to model it. So let's plug that normal back in. And that groove shows up. And, and when you look at it, you're like, wait, but there's a shadow there and light here and not here. And if I move this way, I get more light there and less shadow. So because what a normal map does is it fakes out the render to think that the surface, this flat part of the surface is facing a different direction. So it reacts with the lighting differently. You get different reflections, you get different shadows uh, because of this normal map. So that's what's being plugged in here. Now, if we save this, uh, did I do anything? To, oh, no, no, let's not save it yet. Let's put this back. And we should go back to our regular chair here for the base asset, All right? So everything looks fine. Uh, let's save this, which I shouldn't need to. I didn't hopefully change anything. Let's go back to our uh, third person map. And in the materials folder here, so here's our master material for the chair. Let's, let's make an instance of it and let's see how that works. Create a material instance. I'll just leave it named instance and I'm gonna drag it onto my, my chair here. And here is that parameter being used here. Now, the if I, for this particular chair, this is using M chair instance. I'm gonna double click to open it. And here's my chair. And this time I don't see the whole network. What I see are the different parameters that have been made available for the chair. So if I wanna change the color of the seats, Let's go back and look at the uh, material. Why can I change that input? Well, because the color of the seats is a three vector that's been turned into a parameter, which means you can modify it from an instance versus this over here. This three vector that I made was not right clicked, converted to a parameter. Therefore, I can't access this pink. If I go to my instance, I don't have access to that pink value. 
if I right click, convert it to a parameter and say pink-ish, just so I recognize the name of it and I save that, that's in my master and I go look at the instance, I still don't see it showing up in here because remember this is based on the material and things you would change to the actual base material and it's not being plugged in anywhere. Let's just, uh, just for kicks, throw it somewhere so it makes a part of it and actually speculate. Well, let's put in emissive color uh, just to go nuts. Um, specular is really just wanting a single input, single value input. Um, it would have averaged it, but just to show the use of it. So now if I save the master and I look at the instance, wait for it to save and then look at the instance, I should have that pinkish parameter now that I can modify. So here it is pinkish. If I want to make a change to that, I can come in and modify the uh, pinkish, which is being fed into the emissive color, which we don't really need. So I'm going to I'll click that, nor do we want it. That This is our main chair for the entire starter content. So I'm gonna save the change there, go back to my instance. So these are the things that as an instance, I have access to change. And so again, say I wanna change the color of the seats. So I can come in here, change the seat color on the instance. Maybe I want the roughness of the seats, which we saw earlier we could do deep inside the actual node, but you would use an instance here so you don't wreck it for everyone using it. So this particular one is a lot more shiny. Maybe I'll do the same for the roughness of the metal, make it shiny. All right, so now uh, going back to the map, when you use an instance, you also don't have to mess with saving and applying. It's just kind of, it is already in use. So when you make a change, it's just going to show up here. All right, so now this, this is how I can have multiple chairs using different materials. And if you make another instance of the material, you can customize that instance for yet another chair. So going back to our chair material that they've provided one more time, we've kind of gone through all the different parts of the input here. We have the three parameters that are colors, and we have three parameters that are these single vector values here that we have access to in the instance which you can always change the master material, but it's, again, handy to use the instances. Uh, I have this extra node here I don't need. I can delete it and save if I want, so I'm back to the, the default. So what I would encourage you to do at this point, now that you kind of understand some of the more common uses of material and material nodes, again, this, that's why this is an intro. We're barely scratching the surface of what you could do, but um, this is enough to make you dangerous. Uh, what I would recommend is go back into your starter kit here, your starter content, and take a look at some of these other materials that are being used on different assets. So for example, oh, this you might find interesting. You know, if I bring the couch in here, I say, oh, look at that couch. That must be a different material or a different, how, how what are they using for the couch versus the chair? Let's take a look at the material. So over here, here's the material that this couch is using. And look at that, M chair it's actually using the identical material for the chair. Um, what it's, it's just because of the geometry is kind of stretched. It's, it's really just a stretched chair. If we open up and look at the couch and look at the UVs for it, you're gonna say, that looks very familiar. It is very familiar because again, it's, it's just a stretched version of a chair. So there's nothing too crazy about that. So let's step up our complexity a little bit. I'm gonna bring in this asset so this is part of the starter content as well. And this is a little statue. Now this is where we get to add a little bit more detail here. So this asset, the statue has two elements. So it has two different parts of the shape that are assigned different materials completely. So one part, element zero, is the glass portion. And the only reason I know that really is because it says M glass. And the other says M statue, so that's the base. There's, there's From right here, I would have no way knowing what's element zero and what's element one. Um, let's assign a totally different material. Uh, I'm gonna go to the normal materials folder and I, instead of the glass, I'm gonna drag in the floor. So now here's a floor material instead of the glass. And then for the base, I'm gonna add, let's just add some of this cobblestone. All right, so now I have a cobblestone base and a basic floor as the uh, the surface here. Now when you're in here and you want to go back to the original, just set hit this little hook value and 
that sets them back to use the, the default that they use from the actual asset. Let's take a few minutes to look at the materials of the base and the statue. So we'll do the uh, statue first, because that's not going to be that much different than what we've seen already. So we got a lot of stuff going in here, but it's the same idea. You have you know, some values being lerped together based on a texture map, the red and green. Let's take a look at this texture to see what is red and green. So we got, that's the red channel. That's the green channel. So the blue channel is not being used in this particular example. Where's my statue? And then we have a, uh, we also have a normal map. So taking this apart really is exactly kind of what we just saw on the previous. So, and that's, there's nothing complex about it. It's just the base here. Let's though look now at the statue glass. This is going to use a different part of the material we haven't talked about yet. So let's double click and open this. And we get some values here. It's not, you know, it's not horribly more complex, actually. A lot of the things are similar. We have multiply, we have static values for metallic. Now here they have a value of 0.9 for the metallic for the glass, which, you know, you're gonna ask, didn't you say put in a value from zero to one or zero or one for metallic? Uh, yeah, and I think that's, you'll even find that in Epic's documentation, but it doesn't mean you can't put in partial values, you know, in the end, when it comes to look development, whatever gets you the look you want is kind of more important than sticking to the manual um, in a case like this. And then your specular value, they have, we didn't talk about that, but that's related to your, your highlights as well. Um, roughness is zero, meaning perfectly shiny and reflective. Again, these are nothing new really for us. Um, now, what is new is this has an opacity input and you might think, wait, if I go back to M chair, oh, that's the instance M chair, the opacity is grayed out. How come there's no opacity input for the chair? Um, that is because, let's go back to the glass, see what it has here. We didn't talk about this much before at all, but if I select the actual core of the material here, both of them are surface, but in this case, the blend mode has been set to translucent, meaning you can see through it. If you hit this little button, it'll show you what the default was. Like in uh, um, our chair, our chair by default is set to opaque, right? So if I come to M chair, it is set to opaque, meaning solid. But to get a glass surface simulated, you need to set that to translucent. And then you'll also want to scroll down here and you'll notice this is also, this lighting mode is also not set to the default. If I set it back to the default, it goes to volumetric non-directional, but you want to set it to, or it set it to uh, surface translucency volume. And that just enables some of these values to come in. So it's basically a little more complex shader, but it gets the look that you need. So there is a normal map also being used. Oh, sorry, back to the opacity idea. So what is opacity? In general, opacity means it's see-throughness, right? Controls the transparency of the value. So let's disconnect this for a minute. Let's put in a one value. So if your opacity is zero, that means it is not opaque. So opaque meaning solid. So if it's opaque, if you can't see through it, then it's gonna be a, a solid object. Now, you might be wondering, wait, am I looking through it? No, this is just reflection. So right now it is a solid object. And if you put in zero, it is a fully transparent object. But what we have is a little bit more, I'm gonna take this input, plug it back in for opacity. And what we have going on here is we do have a default opacity value and that's going into a lerp. And this gets a little mathy, but I'll briefly explain what's going on. So we have opacity going into A, and then we have double that opacity going into B, and then we have this controlling your two different opacities from this alpha. So what's going on here? This lerp is a little bit different than what we saw before with the UV coordinates, this is based on the Fresnel, and that has to do with the, Fresnel is when you're looking at the direction of the camera looking at a surface. So Fresnel looking straight on at an object is gonna be different than the edges. So it's, what this is helping do is change the big picture. What's going on here is the opacity is changing as you get out to the edges of the surface versus looking straight through the center 
of the surface. So that's what uh, Fresnel node is doing for you math-wise. So it's just affecting the outside versus the when you look at it from the center to be a little bit different. So that all that value is going to the opacity, meaning the outside edges facing away from the camera are going to have a different opacity than the core of your object. Again, trying just to simulate a look of real physics. And then we have our normal map, which is the same as we saw before. It's just varying the surface based on uh, whatever this map is. And then finally, this is a little bit different for glass, is this concept of index of refraction. So index of refraction is a true thing in the physical world. That's like why you can put a spoon in water and it looks like it's bending because the spoon in water has a different index of refraction. So water itself has, a, just Google it, look up index of refraction table and different properties have different indexes. For example, glass has a value close to 1.5 and air is actually one and um, water has its own index of refraction in different types of gases and different materials. Diamond has a different index of refraction. It just means that the light goes through objects differently. So again, this is an aesthetics choice. You can start with what's physically accurate, but if you want to, you know, you can change that if you want. And again, the Fresnel, same concept, the Fresnel, what's in the center versus the outer edges is going to be slightly different index of refraction because that's being fed into the LERP node, which is varying it from 1 to 1 1.4. So here's your, your index of refraction is being varied from 1 to 1 1.4 based on your Fresnel input into the alpha. But again, it's just a LERP node like we saw before, being modified by a Fresnel instead of a UV input. All those things together are creating our glass texture. So this, this here, and if I were to use an instance of it instead of the actual material, let's go to the actual glass. And let's make an instance and let's see what they have created as, um, I'm going to put that on instead. Did that work? No, try again. So now I have the instance applied. Let's double click and look at the instance. And these are the parameters that they have made available for you to modify related to the fraction and related to the glass itself. So let's say you want your opacity a little bit more opaque. You don't want the glasses see-through. You can do that to say 0.5 instead of 0.3. You know, go all the way up to one and make it a solid. Looks weird being glass otherwise, right? So it's kind of a odd case and if if you made a change you're like shoot I forgot what I even started with you can hit the little button or even just disable it completely all right so again I encourage you to just go through the starter content and see what you can find on the materials in there one last thing if you get really daring go into your characters go into your mannequin go into your meshes and let's throw Manny into the scene and let's see what Manny has for materials so Manny has just two materials. So and Manny uses a material instance. It says MI, Manny 1 and Manny 2. So if we uh, double click here to take a look at Manny's material. Now because it's an instance, I can change things here. It gets a little more complex, which is fine. But it's giving you the option to swap out the textures if you want to use a different texture. Here where it says you got base color and base texture being input. If you wanted to, and what I recommend is, you know, this is fine for the way they've set it up, but if you really want to understand how they put it together, scroll down and look for the parent material. So M mannequin, double click and open that. Then you'll see the full material that goes into uh, Manny. This might be a little bit leaning into the uh, intermediate <laughs> because it gets... Uh, we probably got some material functions going on in here as well. I haven't played in here too much, but there's uh, plenty of things to look into. Maybe, maybe uh, that's what I'll probably do is just make a video uh, dissecting the mannequin material. So I'll put that on my list and we'll do that next. But for now, keep looking at all the, um, what do you call it, the uh, starter content, materials and props and see if you can figure out how all of those are built. Some of them aren't going to be too difficult like uh, a rock or you know you never know it might be a little more difficult but take a look through those and uh, get a good foundation of how these different nodes get put together and uh, try some on your own make modifications and because it's a starter content if you break everything just delete it and re-import a new instance of starter content all right hope this gave you a good start to understanding materials we got a lot more to learn 
But with a solid foundation, it should make the uh, next steps go a little easier. Cheers.